This is the Bay of Marathon on the eastern coast of Greece. I'm Matthew Settle. Over 2,000 years ago, in September 490 BC, 600 ships lay the entire length of this shoreline, while an army of 30,000 Persian invaders raced up the beach. Their mission, to capture Athens and conquer Greece for the empire of Darius, the king of Persia. But 11,000 Greek infantrymen stood in their way here at Marathon. Now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wish they'd had now in decisive battles. This is the burial mound of Marathon. Beneath me lie the remains of Greek soldiers who died in battle on 9-11, 490 BC. At that time, Greece was not a unified nation. It was a collection of independent city-states, like Athens, Corinth, and Sparta, each with their own laws and systems of government. The most influential city was Athens. 20 years earlier, the Athenians had gotten rid of their king, Hippias, who was a cruel and brutal ruler. Athens became a democracy and began to flex its muscle against Persia, the greatest power in the Mediterranean at the time. Athens even supported a revolt of some of the Greek islands, who were trying to break free from Persian rule. The Persians saw themselves having a sort of God-given right to rule the world, and they expanded in every direction. They probably expected most um, countries and nations that they encountered to simply surrender. Um, their procedure of, of uh, declaring war was in fact, in fact to demand a surrender, and if that wasn't then given, uh, they, would, they would fight. The Persian king Darius became furious with the Athenians. He decided that when the time was right, not only would he conquer Athens, but all of Greece. Darius had a servant. Every time he sat down to dinner before he would eat, the servant would whisper in his ear, Sire, do not forget the Athenians. So, when the deposed king, Hippias, fled from Athens to Persia, he received a friendly welcome. I think it would be fair to regard Hippias essentially as a political pawn. Um, the Persians weren't really too concerned what type of regime they would set up in conquered territory, so long as they were confident that he would be loyal to them. In 491 BC, Darius sent envoys to Athens and Sparta. They demanded gifts of earth and water as acknowledgement of the power of Persia. The Greeks threw the envoys into a ravine used for executing criminals. The Spartans threw the second pair down a well. What the Greeks most hated was the idea of slavery, of not being free, and they were determined not to allow themselves to be taken over by a foreign power without a fight. Darius was furious. He assembled a huge fleet of 600 ships and mobilized his army. And when they set out for Greece in 490 BC, the exiled king Hippias sailed with them. The invasion force of 30,000 men was led by Datis, Persian commander in the west. Hippias was only too happy to advise him on the perfect landing place, the broad beach at Marathon Bay. The Persians had very consciously picked a place that suited the kinds of forces that they had. Basically, within the territory of Athens, they couldn't have found pretty much a better place for them to land. This is the plain of Marathon, six miles long and two miles broad. Apart from the marshes at either end, it's an unbroken plain, perfect for the battle tactics of the Persians with their light infantry and cavalry. Even in early September, these marshes were wet and soggy. A man couldn't walk on them, let alone several thousand horses. Hippias did not have a happy homecoming. As he jumped ashore, he had a coughing fit and spat out a tooth. When he looked for it in the sand, he couldn't find it. And he took this as a sign from the gods that he would not regain his kingdom. While Datis unloaded his ships and assembled his men, the Greek army was gathering in the mountains overlooking Marathon. This Athenian army was made up of many local tribes loyal to Athens. 1,000 men each from 11 tribes. 
each commanded by its own general. But in overall command was the Greek general, Miltiades. Missing from these 11,000 men were the fiercest and most feared Greek fighting force, the Spartans. Miltiades sent a runner, Phidippides, to Sparta to ask for help. The Greeks generally used runners as messengers, sometimes horsemen, but very often runners, partly perhaps due to the rough terrain that they often had to negotiate. Phidippides was a day runner, someone who could run all day delivering messages. According to the historian, Herodotus, he ran the 150 miles between Athens and Sparta in two days, but his epic run was all in vain. The Spartans were celebrating a religious festival, and they refused to march until after the full moon. The Spartans were notoriously pious, notoriously slow, notoriously tardy, and, I, and, and arrogant in a way. And I think they felt, oh, we'll just get over there when we get there. Athens would stand alone. Miltiades faced impossible odds. We know very little about this Greek commander. He was from a leading family in Athens and must have had considerable military experience to win command of the army. But we may have one link that stretches back two and a half thousand years. This helmet is an exact replica of the one recovered by archaeologists. It's from exactly the right period and had the inscription, Miltiades dedicates this helmet to Zeus. It was very probably Miltiades' own helmet and was exactly the kind worn by the Greeks at Marathon. The Greek army fought as infantrymen, or hoplites. They were called this after the shield they carried, the hoplon. The hoplite fought in a phalanx formation, an almost unbreakable wall of men and shields pushing forward incessantly. The shield of the hoplite was a big shield, about a meter wide, but it covered only half the body, and therefore the protection comes from the overlapping of each shield with the man next to him. From the mountains high above Marathon, Miltiades and his ten generals had a clear view of the Persian army arrayed beneath them. This was an army over twice their number, with archers from Ethiopia, swordsmen from the banks of the Indus, and wild horsemen from the steppes of Asia. Although all these men were the subjects of King Darius of Persia, they had little in common with one another, not even a common language. The Greeks, on the other hand, were neighbors, standing shoulder to shoulder and brother to brother, fighting to save their independence and way of life. Memories of the tyrant Hippias were fresh in their minds, and death was preferable to him regaining the Athenian crown. But neither side seemed eager for a fight. For four days, the two armies faced each other in a nervous standoff. One reason why the Greeks waited is simply that uh, they were in a very strong position there. They could not, as such, be forced. And the Persians, being so much larger, had a supply problem. And therefore, it was quite likely that supplies would run low and that they might even consider retiring. Datis was holding back in hope that the Athenians, still loyal to Hippias, might rise up and seize control of Athens. On the Greek side, Miltiades waited perhaps in the hope that his forces might be bolstered by the promised Spartan contingent. Neither side would make a move. But in the Persian camp, Datis was hatching a daring battle plan that would break the deadlock. Soon the killing and fighting would begin. The Battle of Marathon. September 490 BC, on the plain of Marathon in Greece, a mighty Persian invasion force was waiting to go into battle against a small Greek army intent on saving their country, their freedom, and their way of life. After four days of stalemate, the Persian commander Datis decided to gamble everything on a quick victory. Under cover of darkness, 
He loaded all of his cavalry and some of his infantry back onto his ships. While the Athenian army was at Marathon, he would sail round the coast, land his troops, and attack the unprotected city of Athens. His faithful commander, Artaphernes, would stay at Marathon with a holding force of around 12,000 men. If Datus thought he could load thousands of horses and men onto his ships and sail quietly away into the night, he was very much mistaken. Miltiades' scouts uncovered the ruins. The Greeks consequently realized here is a danger and an opportunity. The danger is if we don't act now, the city will be captured behind our backs. The opportunity is we can march down into the plain now and take them on because they won't have time to unship their cavalry again. Miltiades had to move quickly. It would take Datus more than 10 hours to sail to Athens and several more hours to unload his army. Miltiades had to win a quick victory at Marathon and then march at full speed back to Athens to confront Datis. What they did was seize what the Greeks called kairos. They had a word meaning opportunity, the opportune moment. And I think the genius of Miltiades is indeed largely responsible for their choosing the right moment. Miltiades marshaled his 11,000 hoplites and readied them for battle. Greeks would normally have formed a rectangular phalanx, but he was worried by the length of the enemy battle line. The Persians could sweep around both sides and envelop the Greek army. We know this kind of detail because of two Greek historians. Herodotus, who wrote in the years after the battle and may even have met some survivors, and Plutarch, who wrote 400 years later but used material from earlier histories. Miltiades took a huge risk and tore up the battle manual. He abandoned the traditional phalanx formation and deployed his troops along the widest possible front so that the center of the line was much thinner than usual, four men deep as opposed to the customary eight. But on each wing, he retained the eight ranks of the conventional phalanx, wanted to protect his flanks. The Greek heavily armored infantry, they had a, you know, a three-foot shield that would cover them from, from brow to knee, greaves down, down here on the shin guards, and then a helmet with just eye slits, so that when they put that helmet at the rim of the shield, uh, they really were pretty much invulnerable. As the Greek army rolled forward, Miltiades was already thinking of the next problem. The massed ranks of Persian archers, deadly at up to 300 yards. The Greeks would have to cover that final distance at speed, or risk being slaughtered. They marched forward at a sedate pace, the usual sedate pace of a hoplite army advancing, until they came within bowshot, which is maybe 100 yards or so. Once within bowshot, the Greeks came under a hail of arrows. Miltiades' troops broke into a run. This astonished the Persians. The phalanx, by its very nature, usually went into battle at a slow, steady pace. The Persian archers would have posed a very serious threat to the Hoplite force. Uh, they had very powerful bows and large arrows that could have done serious damage. Imagine yourself in full armor, with a heavy shield, spear and sword, a total weight of 70 pounds, having to race to the enemy and be able to put up a strong fight when you reached him. There was a British historian who actually built himself a suit of hoplite armor and went to Marathon and ran from approximately the place where the Athenian camp was to the site of the battle um, and showed that a fit man could actually run that distance in armor. The hoplites trained hard for this. There was even a hoplite event in the Olympic Games of the period which involves sprinting over 400 yards in full kit and armor. The Persians were puzzled. From their ranks, all they could see was a long line of Greeks running down on them. Surely they would be out of breath before they even got close enough to fight. These Persian infantrymen were more skirmisher troops than heavy infantry. Lightly armed with short spears and scimitars, they formed ranks as a line of steel-tipped spears came hurtling towards them. The two armies clashed head-on, 
The Persians soon realized their weapons were hopeless against the Greek army, but they fought back valiantly and by sheer weight of numbers began pushing the Greek center back. It looked like Miltiades' gamble had failed, and all the while Datis was sailing closer to Athens. It is 490 BC. The Greek army is being pushed back by Persian invaders, and a Persian fleet is on its way to attack Athens. As the Greeks fell back in the center, the Persian commander, Artaphernes, smelled victory. The way in which Miltiades drew out the Athenian army, enormously lengthening and thinning his center, was one of the riskiest things, I think, in all of ancient warfare. But now the strong Greek phalanxes, on the wings, beat back the thinner Persian line and began to push in towards the center. Each phalanx moved on command as one unit, wheeling left or right, almost turning on a dime. Miltiades' gamble had paid off. As the center fell back, his wings slowly encircled the enemy. The slaughter began in earnest as the heavily armored Greeks hammered into the Persian divisions. And then that whole center of the Persian army became essentially a killing zone. Certainly, to fight that way took uh, uh, great strength and great endurance. And you haven't even talked about the heat of the, of the summer. The Persians continued to throw themselves onto the attacking phalanx, desperately trying to find a way to break it. In the meantime, the Persian archers poured thousands of arrows into the Greek lines, now so closely packed with the Persian infantry that they were bound to hit their own soldiers. The Greeks felt that right and might were on their side and fought like men possessed. Tactics were not so important in those days. It was more just the guts to stand next shoulder to shoulder with your mates and, and, uh, and carry on the fight. The Persians were a broken force. They had never been defeated by the Greeks. But now thousands of their soldiers lay dead or die. Suddenly the Persians broke and ran for their ships, desperate to escape the slaughter. The Greeks raced to cut off their retreat and chase them to the water's edge. There was chaos on the beach, the stampeding troops pushing and heaving to get their craft away while trying to defend themselves from the pursuing hoplites. The surviving Persians sailed away, while the Greeks collapsed, exhausted in the sand. But there was no time to rest. While the battle was raging at Marathon, Datis and his Persian troops were sailing closer to Athens. Miltiades ordered his tired and battle-weary troops to Athens, a forced march of 22 miles in full armor. It had taken him just over three hours to defeat the Persian army at Marathon, but that meant that Datis was three hours closer to Athens. It was a race against time. He sent a runner on ahead with news of victory. According to legend, it was Pheidippides, the same man who had run to Sparta. He ran the 22 miles here to Athens and shouted, Rejoice! We have victory! Then fell dead from exhaustion. Miltiades arrived in the nick of time and managed to set his troops up around Athens. Datis was dismayed when he sailed around the bay and found the Greek army waiting for him. When they saw those Athenians waiting for them, they just didn't have the heart to have another go at these guys who had just inflicted this disastrous defeat on them. He could not even land his army. He thought these troops had been beaten at Marathon, but now here they were, ready to fight again. Acknowledging defeat, he turned his ships around and set a course for Persia. Hippias had guessed right. Not only had he lost his tooth, but any chance of ever regaining his kingdom. And the Spartans? They turned up late and missed out on the glory, but were curious to see what a Persian soldier looked like. They marched on from Athens to inspect the dead. They say that the Spartans were sort of like sightseers toward the battle afterwards, and that they were pretty shaken up to see what great work their rival Athenians had done. 
I think it really did eat at the Spartans' guts that these foppish Athenians had polished off the Persians. If the Persians had won the battle and had occupied Athens, they would then have had a, a basis in mainland Greece for further campaigns, and that might well have changed the course of history. Marathon was a true battle, a real battle that was decisive and that threw back an invading enemy. The fame of Marathon is, in my view, imperishable. It was an extraordinary victory. But for Marathon, you wouldn't then have had the ensuing civilization of the Greeks. The Persians had lost 6,500 men. The Greeks, 192. This was a great victory for Greece, but an even greater victory for Athens. In the space of 20 years, its citizens had got rid of their king and pushed back the Persian Empire. In the process, they had created a new form of government. They called it democratia. We call it democracy. And Pheidippides, his run is remembered at every Olympics. And each year in cities around the world, when ordinary people run the marathon.